this month's episode of Between the Lines, we discuss a new book that helps us to better understand how power works. Recent years have seen a rapid escalation of inequalities, the rise of new global powers and corporate interests, increasing impunity of human rights violations, suppression of civil society, and a reshaping of democratic processes by post-truth populist and nationalist politics. Power, Empowerment and Social Change uncovers how power operates around the world and how it can be transformed through collective action and social leadership. Discussing this collaborative work with IDS Research Officer Katie Oswald, are co-editors Rosemary McGee and Jethro Pettit. So why a book about power, empowerment and social change? Why now? Well, power has always been elusive, shifting its shape and evading definition and the changing nature of power, the way it's been contested both in academia as a concept and in social and political practice as a means of resistance or control, may be the one constant thing we can say about it. Some have argued that there's nothing new to say about power or empowerment for that matter, so it's not worth asking or writing about it. But this hasn't been our experience as editors or as authors. In recent years, we've found ourselves part of a vibrant and growing community of practitioners and scholars who are really deeply interested in how power works, how it's wielded, how it's reproduced, how it can be resisted, how it can be created, and what its implications are for policy and strategy. Getting to grips with power has become an important starting point for organizations, movements, activists, funders trying to figure out what to do. And this, I, th I think, is partly because we're living in a particularly contentious and power-laden time when conventional models of voice and advocacy and influence don't seem to hold. We're seeing major shifts in geopolitics, in new ideological narratives and claims to truth, in the value that's given to human rights, in the space that's available for civic voice, and the front lines of environmental protection and climate activism, struggles for gender equality, sexual freedom, the backlash against them, the powers of digital information flows and mass surveillance. This is all power. And empowerment is also in flux and is not necessarily a progressive or positive thing. Those seeking social justice and equality are having to respond to these new configurations of power and empowerment and to find ways of resisting and countering them. People are needing to become more insightful in their understandings of what power is and how it works, and also to become more resourceful and strategic in creating and mobilizing their own power. So like you said, Jethro, a lot's been written about power in the academic world by social and political scientists. So I'm wondering, how is this book different? Yes, there is a lot of academic scholarship on power, but as we see it, that scholarship has got two key shortcomings. First of all, in the scholarship, there's often very little sign of the practitioners who work on a day-to-day -day basis to shift power in, in real-life situations. And secondly, the scholarship is mainly focused on what we and others call the first dimension of power, or power over, coercive power, power understood as domination. And our book tries to deliberately make itself different from the existing scholarship on both of these counts. So first of all, we try to do that by reflecting in this collection a, a quite broad spectrum of writers, from those who are located in academic and policy research to, on the other end of the spectrum, activists and practitioners who are working on the front lines of liberation struggles and empowerment struggles around the world. For example, we've got uh, contributions from some who work to empower women and overcome patriarchy, colleagues from uh, the organisation Just Associates, which is a movement-building feminist network. We've got some contributors who defend the rights of indigenous people and protect natural resources from exploitation, um, Uruguayan journalist and writer Raul Sivechi, and Fran Lambrick of Not One More, which is an environmental campaign group that supports frontline environmental defenders. We've got some contributors who work to advocate for workers' rights and migrants and excluded castes' rights and all classes of people whose voices are silenced and whose livelihoods are threatened. So uh, Walter Flores from the Centre for Health, Equity and Governance in Guatemala who works with indigenous communities to claim health rights. And there's some contributors who struggle against corporatisation, really, and, and to work to protect democratic participation, social justice, the digital commons. Um, our Indian colleagues, Anita Gurumurthy and Nandini Chami of the NGO IT for Change in Bangalore, write about that in the book. So we've got many contributors who are practitioners first and foremost, rather than inhabiting that world of, of concepts and theory and scholarship. On the other kind of issue that we take with, with the scholarship, that it focuses on this notion of power over, um, we try to focus in the book on the forms of power that are not about dominant coercive power, 
the forms which are less written about and studied. So power within, as in a sense of self-worth, power with, the notion of finding common ground, working with others to, to understand power and try to transform it. Invisible power or third dimensional power, which is the dimension that's much more about the shaping of meaning and thought control, and hidden power in contrast to visible power. So all those those concepts which tend to be less well covered in the existing scholarship. And I think the real difference about the book is that the authors bring in their real world experiences of social change into dialogue with the theory, theorists and the researchers, and that really adds a different dimension to it. That is a very diverse group of people. I'm wondering how they came together to produce this volume. What's the real story behind this book? Well, as practitioners in an applied research institute, we've been working for a few decades now with a vibrant network of development workers, activists, and researchers around the world to come to grips with the ways in which power is working against efforts for progressive social change, and also to better understand how disenfranchised people and groups have been creating and mobilizing their own power this work for us has taken the form of collaborative and action research projects, training and popular education, working together with organizations and movements, designing and facilitating workshops and retreats. Our approach has been practical and applied, while at the same time drawing on and adapting academic theories of power and empowerment. A lot of the academic literature we've found isn't very accessible, even if it does contain ideas that can be applied. So in this process, a lot of useful lessons have, have emerged about what works, what doesn't, and useful frameworks have been developed for interrogating and building power in real situations. Concepts have been put to the test and adapted to make them more useful to practitioners. So we eventually reached a point where there was clearly a lot of valuable material and experience that we could bring together. And the idea was born to assemble these voices into a book that would bridge theory and practice in a way that would be useful to both academics and activists. I could just give a quick example here. Uh, there's some very interesting theory uh, proposed by Mark Haugard, building on Giddens, around the fact that in every moment of every action, we are either confirming or disconfirming structures, that is, the sort of underlying structures of society in everything we do and say. And this is a really useful idea when you think about articulating uh, alternative strategies, acting differently in situations of power, practicing resistance strategies, and so on. So it's very practical and useful, but it's often, like many theories of power, expressed in a rather arcane um, academic language and debated in communities where practitioners don't hang out. So those are the kinds of things that we've been able to kind of adapt and bring into practice in a way that makes them useful and accessible. So how have you gone about presenting this material in a way that is accessible to such a diverse audience? How is the book conceived and organised? The chapters are clustered into four sections, um, and each of the sections has got a particular orientation. So the first section is about concepts and theory and debates. And here we try to reappraise some of the really long-standing ways of understanding power in the light of some recent tendencies like corporatization and commoditization, digitization, and also in the light of evidence of the limited effectiveness of common ways that people have, have been working to try to shift power. <clears throat> the second section then is about frameworks and approaches for understanding power. And here the authors write about various lenses or frames for understanding power and for applying these understandings so as to transform power relations. And they might be focusing on particular aspects of social justice or specific organizational contexts, but generally working in the face of some really stubborn, entrenched inequalities and injustices. For example, we've got colleagues from the organization Gender at Work who have written about gender discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace and are sharing their frames for, for working on that. Um, Joe Rowlands of Oxfam has written about uh, working as an Oxfam staff member in the ethnically divided and post-authoritarian context of Myanmar and shares, again, the, the approaches that Oxfam has used to trying to understand power. And then in the third section, we present some actual case studies of action for social change, which show what power and empowerment and agency and resistance mean in practice in a range of different social, political and organisational contexts. Um, to give an example here, our colleague Mario Kosterum from IDS writes about using power analysis in violent settings to help overcome fear and to support collective action among people who live in a situation of fear and intimidation. And then the final section is about learning and unlearning about power. And here we share some quite diverse experiences of supporting people to 
firstly, perhaps unlearn some preconceptions and learn really honestly about their own power and empowerment in, in different sectors and areas of activity. So one chapter there is about the higher education sector, where we write about the Masters in Power Participation and Social Change here at IDS, which is destined for development and social change activists to really try to become more mindful and reflective practitioners in whatever their particular area of work is. Um, one contributor here writes about the development aid world, Rosalind Aben, uh, writes about where efforts have been made there to work with official aid agency staff to make them much more aware of their power and about how they use it. Um, and also here there's a chapter that writes about feminist popular education as an important way of raising consciousness, unlearning preconceptions, working to transform visions um, among women who suffer from really multiple complex dimensions of discrimination. So that's to give a bit of a flavour of how the book is conceived and organised and how it addresses what we hope will really be quite a diverse readership. Great. What would you both say are some of the most important messages about power in this book? Well, one thing I think that sets the book apart from mainstream academic literature on power is its multidimensional approach to power analysis and using this not just to explain power in its negative manifestations, but also to develop strategies for building resistance and power from below. Political economy, for example, is widely used, but has limited ability to guide transformative action. The underlying premise is that actors know what they want, and they'll compete for influence driven by their self-interest and a kind of utility maximizing behavior. Our book really tries to delve below the waterline to address dimensions of power that are more elusive and are often ignored in these more instrumental methods of power analysis with their focus on more visible players and formal political processes. So for example, we take a fresh look at what has been called invisible power or the third dimension of power. That's the dominant narratives, the ideologies, the socialized norms that underpin social structures and allow them to reproduce themselves. And with the authors, we look for the points of leverage, the points of resistance of countervailing power, such as those that can be found in popular education, in movement building, in efforts to create new narratives. And this sort of fits what I was saying earlier about the different ways that people can disconfirm structure to draw on the theoretical debates about confirming and disconfirming structure. A second thing that I think is unique is that we take a fresh look at what's sometimes been called the second dimension of power or hidden power, which is classically defined as the behind the scenes, agenda setting, mobilizing, mobilizing bias, gatekeeping, who's in the room, who's out of the room, and so forth. And I think what we're seeing in the world today is that hidden power is taking a much more insidious and dangerous form. It's showing up in the form of collusion among organized and violent criminal groups, corporations and extractive industries, security and paramilitary forces and state actors all sort of working together. I wonder, Jethro, if you could give some examples, um, like a specific example of where um, people have organised to resist or challenge invisible power. Well, many of the authors are coming from experiences of popular education and movement building, which you can really think of as not just a process of mobilizing people out onto the streets to demand their rights, but a much more long-term, slow-building process of building power from within, from within the individuals involved, and building collective power uh, among the individuals involved. And that often involves processes of popular education, consciousness raising, uh, dialogue, uh, a lot of facilitated work, often using creative methods, artistic methods, movement, um, music, as well as hard political analysis to understand power and to understand how power works through ideology and through socialization. For example, in the case of gender relations and patriarchy, where a lot of this thinking has come from, um, some of the authors come from um, feminist uh, an analysis, uh, such as the work of Just Associates, and the work of uh, Gender at Work, who've been working for a long time on addressing these more invisible, deeply embedded and embodied dimensions of power and how to transform them, um, connecting the personal and the political. And uh, th those are the kinds of examples that the authors really speak to and illustrate in great detail 
for example, Just Associates' work in Mesoamerica, Central America and Mexico, uh, in which they've done years of um, deep, transformative movement building work with women um, using popular education techniques uh, that have been developed over many years and really quite effectively building new leadership, consciousness, and power among women um, in all diverse sections of society. Another, another aspect of the book that I think has been, um, I'll just start that again. Another way in which the book addresses the multiple dimensions of power is taking a fresh look at what's sometimes called hidden power or the second dimension of power. And that's sort of classically been defined as the behind the scenes agenda setting, gatekeeping and mobilization of bias that you find in all pluralist political systems. And I think what many of the authors and particularly the authors from Just Associates, Lisa Veniklassen, Valerie Miller, Alexa Bradley, draw out is the ways in which hidden power is becoming more insidious and often more difficult to see. If you can imagine something hidden being more difficult to see, they're actually now using the word shadow power to describe the ways in which uh, power is operating through organized violent and criminal groups, extractive industries, security and paramilitary forces, and state actors all working together with each other with various degrees of collusion and corruption. And um, many of the authors speak to the need to identify and expose this kind of more insidious shadow power, which evades the usual channels of political and legal redress. And it also uh, is not very responsive to the traditional forms of advocacy um, and lobbying that we often hear are the ways that you try to change policy. So an example of this in the book, w among others, would be Fran Lambrick's chapter about her experience working with forest defenders, indigenous people in Cambodia, Central America, Brazil, who are literally fighting for their lives and to protect forest lands, ancestral lands that uh, are, belong to the indigenous people, and whose leaders are being killed with impunity. We're now in a situation where the human rights of forest defenders are no longer being protected, and where people like Berta Cáceres in Honduras, Chatwati in Cambodia, are literally being killed by uh, state-backed armed forces who are working in collusion with investors, with dam builders, with loggers. Um, and there's very little that one can do uh, without really unpacking how that power is operating behind the scenes and addressing it, uh, calling the investors to account, as happened in the case of the Berta Cáceres murder, where the investment company behind the mine was exposed and where the Honduran soldiers who carried out the murder are being prosecuted, at least at one level, if not at the highest levels. So these are the kinds of things where shadow power is needing to be addressed, um, and not just in the kind of classic sense of hidden power in pluralist politics, uh, as much of the theory describes it. And perhaps just a third and final example of the multi multiple dimensions of power is to sort of turn power on its head and to think of it in its positive manifestations that successful social movements and people's organizations and NGOs, uh, people who are organizing for their rights, have their own power and they can build their own power. And this is described in the book as transformative power, a term that comes from, again, the work of Just Associates. It can be broken down into various components, which are flexible and changing all the time, but they're often described as power to, which might be considered just agency, the ability to do something. Power within, which is the sense of self-worth and dignity uh, that comes with consciousness and awareness. Power with, which is collective action, the ability to do things together in a much stronger way. And in this book, you'll find a discussion also of something called Power Four, which is the ability to articulate a vision, know what it is that you stand for, create a new narrative, 
unite people around a new social vision. So these are the kinds of things that I think where we begin to see empowerment understood as civic and political agency, as imagination, as dignity, as self-worth, and as collective action. And many of the authors consider this personal and embodied dimension of this process as very, very important, that you can't just leap to political power through sort of classical political uh, ways of organizing, that you need to build up the power within, the dignity, the power with, the collective action, and to integrate the personal and the political in social change efforts. I think for me one of the really important messages is about the need to somehow move beyond toolkits and gadgets to much deeper work on understanding and transforming power in some of the less visible forms or the less intuitively recognisable forms that Jethro just talked about. Tools and gadgets are so very common in the development world and, and they're useful, we need them for analysis and for action and indeed you know, some of the material in the book is about the power cube which is a model that really integrates a lot of different ways of understanding power, a very versatile, very, very useful tool for diagnosis, for analysis and for strategizing about power that has been put to many uses as the chapter explains. But I think a lot of the book's content also demonstrates the problems that are associated with a very toolkit-centric type approach and, and with superficial use of tools or unreflective use of tools. One of the problems, of course, is that when you're trying to use a particular tool, attention can end up getting focused on the wrong thing. It gets focused on whether you're using the tool right rather than on whether using a tool at all is the right thing to be doing in a particular instance. And, and rather than focusing perhaps on the power issues themselves, the tool becomes too much the centre of the exercise. Um, I think another big problem in relation to power is that when you focus on the tool, you divert attention away from the people who are bringing in the tool and using the tool. And very often, they have a particular part in the power dynamics that you're trying to work with, which really needs analysing and needs understanding and might need changing. But they're kind of hiding behind the tool, and, and therefore that aspect of it doesn't get addressed. I think a, a further issue with a tool-centric approach, which we've seen an awful lot in the development and international aid world, is the very unreflective tendency to import concepts and frameworks, in this case about power, into social or cultural contexts where they're really alien and where they don't sit well with people's lived experience and understandings of, of the issue. So a toolkit or tools, while they're very helpful for understanding and for strategizing, just aren't enough in themselves. And they're only as good as the sensitivities of the user. The, the way that the tool gets applied is as good as the understandings of the context and the actors with, with whom it's applied. So we're not providing a toolkit with the book but even though it isn't a toolkit, it does very much aim to make a significant practical contribution as well as some of the theoretical and conceptual contributions that we've talked about. And we recognise in practice in the book that frameworks and toolkits are used and can be very helpful. But what we try to do is to provide some of what else is needed as well as the tools, to provide a range of ways to think and to do reflectively and to use tools reflectively in relation to power. One way that we do this is... Um, in several of the chapters, writers are really demonstrating the importance of working to explore power and strategize about power together with the people or the social groups who are the, the problem owners, if you like, the ones who live immersed in, in particularly problematic power relations. And several chapters really illustrate how vital this is for developing contextualized enough understandings and well-honed strategies for action. Um, Joe Rowland's chapter, for example, focuses on how Oxfam staff and partners that Oxfam works with can do much deeper and broader power analysis using participatory reflective approaches. And she draws on the experience of years of trying to do that within Oxfam um, and really teases out some of the nuances of how tools need to be used in order to make sense of, of some of the situations that Oxfam is working in. The chapter by Walter Flores about working with indigenous communities in Guatemala um, his organisation is all about the inequities of the health system, particularly from the perspective of very marginalised, geographically marginalised rural indigenous women. Um, his chapter talks about how his organisation started out by taking some of the common tools that lots of us here at IDS have known and propagated and, and taught on and trained with, um, and how they started off using these and then stopped and reflected and realised that the tools were effectively driving the analysis and even distorting the analysis and were bringing in new frames of thinking which were not the ones that, were, that came most naturally to the people that they work with. So they tore up the tools and instead started uh, asking really reflective questions of these people who 
were the experts in powerlessness who really knew the realities of their powerlessness and their marginalization so intimately. Another way in which I think we, we I hope, uh, help people to use tools well is to offer lots of examples of the principle of working upwards from people's experience of the problem at issue. So this might be through action learning and action research type approaches. It might be starting, as in Walter's chapter, which I just talked about, from that very micro level analysis rooted in people's everyday experience, um, using experiential learning approaches, facilitating collective approaches to understanding and strategizing, which really start off building from people's own experience. Um, there's a chapter in here which Jethro and I actually co-authored with an ex-IDS student of ours, all about the Masters in Power Participation and Social Change at IDS, which supports development actors and change practitioners through a year-long process of learning, which I think we could characterise as experiential learning, reflective learning, and trains them in action research approaches, very much in line with these arguments. Another important contribution that we make to the unreflective use of toolkits is pointing to the self in power analysis, both the self as part of the power dynamic or as part of the problem, and the self as part of the solution. So on the self as part of the problem, Rosalind Aben, with her years of experience in the Department for International Development, working as an aid practitioner in an official agency, writes about the need to put power into the discussion with official aid actors um, and bring themselves into to connection with the power debates. Um, rather than uh, painting them out of the picture and treating them as if they are not actors with any significant power part to play. She writes about having uh, run training workshops with DFID staff where the notion of power was really hard to bring into the conversation even though what they were talking about were issues of gender injustice or racial injustice and how the power word was almost a taboo word and even when brought in, it was very, very difficult to turn that round as a mirror on the aid agency actors themselves and get them to consider their own position in aid relationships and in the power relations that they were talking about. And a chapter which uh, positions the self very centrally, but the self as part of the solution, is the chapter at the end of the book by Maria Arce and Val Miller from Just Associates, where they describe using uh, popular education approaches with women at the grassroots level in Mesoamerica, in, in Central America and Mexico, to really develop their own power through approaches such as understanding power within and working to um, develop their self-esteem and their strength as individuals and then their collective strength to address some of the situations that they're living in. Just finally, I think we, we need to say that one of our big driving forces in putting the book together was the objective of really bringing theory and practice into dialogue with one another in this area of power, getting the theoreticians and the practitioners to come together a bit around some of the, the key issues that we feel really have been left out of debate so far. I'm really trying to make sure that theory and practice get the most out of each other. So to far too much of the debate on power in the political science journals is incredibly disconnected from real people and their real problems, very blind to them, the people who are really on the hard end of unfair power dynamics. And some of the debates almost give the impression that understanding power is just about you know, intellectual curiosity, a theoretical problem to resolve. So we wanted the book to contribute to really making power theory more accessible, as Jethro has already said, and really enable people to use it in their efforts to resist and transform power. I tried to do this a bit in the chapter I've written in the book about rethinking accountability from a power perspective. I start off by describing the various branches of power theory and how it's developed, and I'm sure it's one of hundreds of accounts of this that now exist in print, but in doing so I was really trying to demystify some of the aspects of power theory that I have really grappled with and found really hard to understand and hard to connect and to link. Um, and, and have also found very, very distant from practice. And I've done it in the hopes that through that kind of quite laborious demystifying, um, practitioner readers might be able to see in that demystified version some more insights that can illuminate their practice. I think we really need to ask as well, not just how can the theory be more useful to the practitioners, but how can practitioners' innovation and adaptation and reframing and contextualization, which they do constantly and really intuitively, instinctively, how can all of that enrich and deepen power theory? And here I think you know, there are lots of chapters that we can signal, but um, some of the chapters by our colleagues from Just Associates, for example, present their continuous reflection on their practice over decades, where if they would only get noticed by the power theorists, really do stand to refresh and update power theory for our times and for addressing contemporary challenges. 
Power theory is just too important to leave to academic political science debates. And those debates tend to get dominated by northern white elites like ourselves, very often male elites as well. So they're very rarely grounded in any experience of marginalization. And I think the book really shows that besides academic power theory, there's practical power theory, which is evolving out of everyday continuous practice. We really seek to make the roles of practitioners visible in those processes of theory building about power and empowerment and social change. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Katie. Thanks. If you like this, then please subscribe and share. Between the Lines is a monthly podcast, published the first Wednesday of every month. It's brought to you by the Institute of Development Studies. Follow us on Twitter at IDS underscore UK or visit ids.ac.uk.